Okay, good uh, morning, everyone. And thank you all for, for coming to uh, hear Jonathan. And, uh, and very nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Jake Wallace-Simons. I'm the editor of the Jewish Chronicle. And I'm going to be interviewing uh, Jonathan about his fantastic new book, uh, The Escape Artist, uh, One Man's Escape from the man who broke out of Auschwitz to, uh, to, to warn the world. Uh, so it came out four months ago, is that right? In June, yeah. In June, in June. So it's, but it's still a new book. It is. Uh, so Jonathan needs no introduction, but uh, anyway, I'm going to introduce <laughs> him. Uh, he, he's mainly known, of course, because he's uh, a columnist for the Jewish Chronicle. Um, but he also writes for another paper, don't you? I'm not sure which one. It's, it's so, so, a lesser paper, uh, The Guardian. And, um, uh, and presents Radio 4 and has written 11, 11 books, I think. Is that right? It's actually 12. This is the this 12th, is the 12th book. book. Yeah. But most um, of them not under my own name. That's right. So I think, it's, is it nine that are not under your Correct. name, yeah. which are thrillers under the name of Sam Bourne? That's right. Um, and this is your third non-fiction, non-fiction book. Mm. Uh, so I'm going to be asking Jonathan all about uh, his book and uh, telling you the story <coughs> of it, although leaving certain bits out so that you'll want to read it yourselves. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, for the last 15 minutes, open the floor to questions if anybody wants to ask anything. Uh, we've got two roving microphones, I think, somewhere. So hopefully that, over there. So hopefully that will, that will all work seamlessly, as I'm sure it usually does. <coughs> um, so, Jonathan, welcome. Thank you. Very good to be here. Um, I thought of asking you first about how the idea started for the book, where it all began. I understand it began in the 80s, is that right? It did. It began um, when I was 19 years old, um, which is sort of oddly fitting because when the man at the centre of the story uh, escaped from Auschwitz, he was 19. Um, I was in, an, in a cinema seeing the first part of the epic uh, show, uh, Holocaust documentary, Claude Landsman's film, Shoah, nine and a half hour long film. Um, that it, it was shown in two parts at the Curzon in Mayfair, and I went to see it in 1986. So to save you the math, that means I'm 55. <laughs> I've effectively told you that. Um, and I was sitting there watching this film, and it's a really unusual documentary. A few people here will have seen it. The, there's no archive in it. Um, it's just talking head interviews. And to my 19-year-old self watching it, it looked to me like this succession of very old uh, and sort of broken men, mainly men, some women too, until suddenly on screen explodes this figure who's completely different from all the others. He looks a generation younger in some ways because he was, but where the others were sort of grey and pale and, and often, you know, stooped, he is tanned and handsome. He has a thick head of lustrous dark hair. He's speaking in English. Most of the others are speaking uh, through translators and interpreters. He's in New York City. He's not in, you know, Poland or Germany. Uh, he's, and he's wearing this kind of tan leather coat. He looks like, you know, Al Pacino in Scarface or something. Uh, he's a very handsome man, very charismatic. And almost as an aside, actually, in the film, it's mentioned that he had escaped from Auschwitz. And even as a 19-year-old, I knew that, in effect, Jews didn't really ever escape from Auschwitz. I mean, that was almost unheard of. As it happened, that isn't really what interests Landsman, because Landsman wants to talk to Rudolf Werber, who we're talking about, because Werber had been in Auschwitz for nearly two years, which is extremely rare. I mean, most people, you know, the life expectancy of a Jew in Auschwitz was measured in hours. Uh, there were some, through the process of selection, the majority were obviously sent to the left to their deaths. A, you know, a very small proportion were sent to the right to become prisoners. But they too usually lived for months, um, uh, through, you know, ground down by disease or hard labor or, or uh, murder. And the, that was a policy. It was called annihilation through labor. You weren't meant to survive. Here was a man who'd been there two years, and he had worked as a slave in all diff multiple parts of the camp. And so it meant that he was this kind of uber witness. He had this incredible perspective on the whole process. Apart from inside the gas chambers himself, Ferber was never a Sonderkommando, someone who worked inside the gas chambers. He did everything else and saw everything else. 
That's why Lansman wanted to interview. Um, and uh, I, though, that sat there at age 19 just thinking, tell me more about the escape. How did you get out? How did you do that? Um, and the story sort of stayed with me. The name stayed with me for years and years and years. Always there somewhere in the back of my mind. Particularly because, as you mentioned just by saying the subtitle of the book, because his purpose in getting out had been to warn the world, to get the truth out from under this you know, mountain of lies that, 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 that the camp represented. And so, just to answer really why I came, you know, your question, why I came back to it was in recent years, in the era of post-truth and all that, I found myself again and again, from 2016 onwards really, thinking again about this man who had done the ultimate act of truth-telling at the, at the most extreme possible risk. And so I just, that, the story began when I was 19, but it came back to me very recently. It sounds like one of the things that most attracted you about the story was the fact that, it, that he, as a character, or as a person, uh, stood out. He wasn't the same as other <coughs> survivors that you'd encountered. And the story he was telling was different from the story, or a different, a different uh, way of looking at the same story. Um, do you feel that um, that's carried through, uh, through the book? And do you feel that that is... Um, why the book has done so brilliantly well so far? Well, I mean, that's very kind of you to say that. I, I, I think one of the... I, I, it's hard for me to guess what, why it's landed. I certainly didn't assume it would, um, and, and if, I've been sort of astonished by the interest it has aroused, partly because he didn't get this attention in his life. Um, he was, you know, Landsman sought him out, uh, the great chronicler of the Holocaust, Martin Gilbert, sought him out, but most other people didn't. Uh, and he was not one of those people who became, you know, one of those sort of iconic names associated with the Holocaust. He didn't win the Nobel Peace Prize like Elie Wiesel. His book was not regarded as a classic. He did write a memoir in the very early 60s. It's not regarded as a classic in the, in the way that Primo Levi would be. The fact that his actions, and we'll get on to explain how, did save by my estimation, 200,000 lives did not make him a, a, a sort of legend like Oscar Schindler, who I think is credited with saving 3,000 lives. Um, all of those, you know, he did not have their fame. And one of the reasons why does relate to this thing that made him different, which was he wasn't like other Holocaust survivors. And he was, incidentally, really aware of this. Um, and one of the things I found in his papers was a letter he wrote to a BBC producer who wanted him to come on a, on, a, on a documentary film. And Verba says to him, you know, I should warn you, I am not the cliched Holocaust survivor. Uh, and what he meant by that in a way was, and this goes to how we expect, I think, Holocaust survivors to behave, which is to be this kind of almost healing spiritual figure you know, like an encounter with a Holocaust survivor should be like an encounter with the Dalai Lama, you know, where they dispense great wisdom having witnessed, having stared into the abyss of human behavior. They have come out and emerged with this sort of morally uplifting wisdom. He wouldn't play that game. He was an angry man. And, well, that, that's, and we should, you know, well, we'll get to that as in the story tells, yeah, you'll see why. Yeah, exactly. So if we start at the beginning then. Yeah. So you start to, you know, have the idea of writing this book. You, you begin to think about it. You... Uh, get the story together and you begin telling it. But there's a story in that itself, isn't there? I mean, there is, because I, he had left behind quite a lot of documents, which was incredibly helpful. There was that memoir, 60-plus years old now, or 60 years old. Uh, he had also been a witness, often in court cases, so there were court transcripts. There was lots of him talking. But I knew that I wanted also, you know, the memories and reflections of other people. He... he Ha left behind a widow, his second wife, Robin Verber, who lives still in the United States. And she and I talked a lot, and she had kept lots of papers, wonderful. There were papers of his kept in a library in New York, also fantastic. But he also had had a first wife, um, uh, who I knew had been at some point in London. And I knew that a long time ago she had been a professor at UCL in London. And that was more or less all anybody knew. I called a few people who I thought would know, and they said, look, we, you know, she's not in our record, so I don't know how, how you can find her. And I did that thing that journalists in this room will know you sometimes do, which is when you essentially guess at someone's email, uh, first name dot last name at ucl.ac.uk, you know. 
And I wrote this email, again, I think we've probably all done this, where you are writing it in such a way, because I knew that she would have been 93 years old. So I wrote this email in such a way that it could be read by somebody else, you know, because I thought this is going to be picked up by a university administrator or, a, or, or perhaps a bereaved son or daughter. And I said, you know, dear Goethe Verbova, I want to write, etc. And I sent it off. I was relieved that a second later it didn't come back undeliverable, uh, you know, that, she, that there was nothing. And about less than an hour later, you know, ping in the inbox, um, from somebody who I you know, had no idea if they were still around, saying, Dear Jonathan, I am very glad to hear from you. I am alive and I am living in Muswell Hill in <laughs> North London. Why don't you come and see me on Thursday? And this was in the middle of the COVID summer of 2020, lockdown summer. So she and I sat in her garden in that summer. She was 93 years old. She was very frail. We were further apart than you and I now are. I had my uh, you know, recorder, digital recorder, which I pushed across the ground on with my foot because I didn't want to be too near and accidentally give her anything. Uh, and we talked for hours and hours. It turned out that she wasn't just his first wife. She had also been his teenage sweetheart. And she had been, they had both been in the Slovak town of Ternova uh, before the war. And therefore, she knew the man before Auschwitz. In fact, before he was Rudolf Werber. He was born with the name Walter Rosenberg. And we had these five or six long conversations where she told me about the boy who became the man. And in the last of these, she said, look, my grandson is here because there's something from upstairs I want you to have, and I can't get it down myself. And her grandson, Jack, went upstairs, and he came down with this red suitcase. And the two of them handed it to me, and she said, those are Rudy's letters. And she said, I want you to have them. And it was that moment where I thought, on some level, I am sort of meant to write this story. Um, I felt a great responsibility to do it. The letters were a, a revelation and um, gave me something which you just couldn't have got from anywhere else. And so I embarked on that story. Uh, and two days after the last of those meetings we had, I got a phone call from Jack, the grandson, to tell me that his grandmother had had a fall and had died. Um, but he said, and the family said, that they felt this had been very important to her to tell this story as, in effect, her last act. Writer's block. I mean, that, that sounds like a lot of burden to be, or a lot of responsibility to be carrying into the first sentence when you sit yeah. down and, yeah. and face the blinking cursor. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it was a strange thing, the writing of this, because you know, again, lots of writers in this room, on a good day when you're writing, you do get into a kind of flow and momentum and those sentences are coming. And I found that especially with writing fiction. Here, I found something that was, it felt at the time, really, um, uh, well, crippling is putting it too, too strongly, but uh, difficult, which was I would get three words into a sentence and then think, well, does he come, he's just, I've said he's come out of the barracks, does he go left or does he go right? And I don't want to guess, because this subject, there is, I felt, zero room for imagination or conjecture. The, given the climate of those who wish to deny the Holocaust, I wanted to make sure that every last detail in this book was grounded in documents, in fact. So I would be halfway through a sentence, and I would go back to the testimony, go back to this letter, back to a map, back... And it was slow. It was much slower than anything I've written before. Um, and you know, it means that if you read in the book something that looks actually sometimes quite fictionalized, like, for example, there is one moment where you know, a bead of sweat forms on his back uh, you know, in tension, that's because I have a letter or, or a text in which he says, at that moment, I felt a bead of sweat on my back. Um, I didn't allow myself to make up anything at all. And that made it a much more kind of meticulous process than I, uh, you know, had ever been used to with, with fiction. And you're, it's interesting you, you mentioned fiction because uh, you're a thriller writer and mm -hmm. the book sometimes reads with the pace and the immediacy of a thriller. And as a story, it's, it's, it's so astonishing. It's got so many thrills and spills. It's so gripping. Um, what were your thoughts about using the techniques of thriller writing but apply it to such uh, a profound and difficult and troubling uh, and poignant story? 
that well, belongs, that belongs you, to somebody no, else. I agree. No, I'm glad you responded that way. I, I, that was you know, conscious and deliberate. I thought that even as I wanted it to be absolutely you know, nailed down accurate and historically sound, I also wanted people to read it. And there are books on the Holocaust that are really you know, r- r- rigorous and sound, but that are too unread. And I didn't want that to happen. I wanted this to feel like an, a, a gripping story. That said, that, it wasn't difficult because this is a gripping story. I mean, it's part of this process and also just being perhaps, you know, male and my age. I've read quite a lot of Second World War escape stories and I've, I'm, you know, I'm obviously biased, but I think this is the most thrilling escape story of the whole of the Second World War. What he and Fred Wetzler, there were two of them, did and the ingenuity and the, and the physical courage required to escape from Auschwitz. I mean, we should say there were prisoners who did escape from Auschwitz, but they were mainly either Soviet prisoners of war or Polish prisoners, Polish political prisoners. Jews were kept under such a tight reign. The odds were so stacked against them that until he and Wetzler did this, no one, no Jew, had ever broken out without anybody helping them out, broken out of the camp and successfully made their way to freedom. It just had not happened. You know, besides the 15 foot high electrified uh, fences, first if you cleared one, then there was another one, uh, you know, watchtowers with uh, SS men armed with machine guns at every 80 yards, uh, searchlights sweeping every inch, 2,000, 3,000 SS men, specially trained dogs, etc. I mean, it was impossible to escape, and yet somehow, he and Wetzler came up with this absolutely ingenious plan to do it. So how else but, in a way, with suspense and sort of, it it would be, um, you'd have to almost fight the urge to write it as a thriller because it is a genuinely thrilling story. Um, There are other aspects of it too that I think actually they they aren't, you know, physical adventure stories in quite the way that one is, but they are also really the stuff of thrillers with, you know, well, we'll get on to it. Well, I mean, but before we move on to the actual story of the escape and what came next, uh, just another word on the on the craft of writing it. Um, I mean, when I wrote this book, um, which they've kindly propped up, uh, which is about the Kinder transport, it was similar in a certain way because uh, I was writing about a very well-known story: um, Auschwitz, Kinder transport, the Holocaust. People have seen many, many films about it, have read about it. Yeah. It's already in um, the, 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 the public consciousness uh, in a very, very deep way. And it's almost like if you're asking somebody to imagine something, um, they already have so many images of, of what that thing is that it's easier to evoke those associated images uh, rather than what you're trying to show them, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, how did you... I mean, what, what I did was you avoid using words like swastika or Nazi to try to stop triggering those, memories, those associations. How did you deal with the facts that you're covering? Although it's a new story, it's such a well-worn um, topic that's so familiar to people. Well, he, here, as, in, as so often, I'm really indebted to him, to Rudolf Verber, because this is the reason why Claude Landsman sought him out. Because he was there so long, he had this full panoramic view of Auschwitz, which actually isn't well known at all. And the thing that has been really gratifying to me is the messages I've had from people who are, you know, everyone in this room would consider experts and scholars in the Holocaust who say, I have to tell you, there are things in there I didn't know about Auschwitz. And there are quite a few of them. and, And the main one is, it was this sort of functioning place. Yes, there were, I think what people know is, Jews arrived on trains and went to gas chambers. I think that's what most people know about Auschwitz. The fact that there was also this slave labor camp, often in a population in the high tens of thousands, in effect, that had an industrial plant and had this permanent population, including a small but permanent Jewish population who were working, in effect, this is what Rudy eventually did, as a sort of barracks pen pusher, and that there was a hierarchy, there was a resistance, an underground within uh, Auschwitz, that there was an Auschwitz economy, a black market, that there were luxury, there was a trade in luxury goods, which we can you know, talk about how come that existed and how come Rudy saw it, that there was, um, you know, sex. I mean, Rudy lost his virginity in Auschwitz. How that comes about and, and, and the context of that is all in there. But I think it's, um, 
you know, it is a much more kind of full picture that he provided through his letters and those transcripts and other things that I found because he was there so long and saw there was this whole world, this hierarchy of prisoners, you know, the political differences between them. There was a world there. It was this sprawling city, a very great writer and witness, Otto Dovkulka, calls it the metropolis of death, uh, that it was like a, a whole place. And he was there and was able to give a kind of witness. And I think that is the thing that has been really an eye-opener to people because it isn't just, although Rudy really did see, the trains arrive on the, he worked for 10 months straight on that railway platform and saw those selections. Even actually that, how those worked is an eye-opener, I think. Mm. Uh, but it was, there was a whole, you know, upside down, morally inverted universe of Auschwitz and he was right at the centre of it and saw it all. So, I mean, take us into this, um, this metropolis of death in a way. I mean, without, without giving away too much about mm. what the book contains, mm. can you just give us a, a, a sort of step-by-step um, -step idea of what happened? So he arrives yeah. in Auschwitz and take us through all the way to the escape and, sure. and, and to the conclusion. I mean, he arrives there actually in some ways relieved to be there. And this was the reaction of a lot of people who got there because it was this built, you know, brick structure. It wasn't, he'd come from a previous camp that was, um, you know, wooden huts and mud. And he, suddenly you get to this place that looks pretty substantial. It had been built as barracks for, by the Polish army, relieved to be there. He is then assigned to different jobs. And I describe some of those, backbreaking, slave labor, watching as his fellow prisoners literally dropped to the ground dead. And he's 19 at this point, he's isn't 70 he? He's 17 when he arrives. I mean, he's, he arrives on the last day. 1942? The last day of June, 1942, he arrives as a 17-year-old. He's a teenage boy. And he, having tried, actually, multiple escapes before, the reason why the book is called The Escape Artist is the Auschwitz escape is not the only one. He's a, he's a serial escapologist, you know, both before Auschwitz and indeed afterwards. Uh, which the book details. But he arrives there, he's assigned to different jobs. Uh, the first really significant one, he is in a place called Canada, K Canada with a K, that's a nickname that the Auschwitz prisoners give to this place, which is kind of the Auschwitz El Dorado. It is where these luxury goods are. Luxury goods because all goods are there, piled up, and he is astonished by what he sees, are mountains of blankets, of pots and pans, of clothes, women's clothes, men's clothes, and a big pile of children's clothes. And he sees prams, and he sees all this stuff, including are things that people brought with them to barter and exchange. So there are cognac and silk and diamonds that people have stashed, you know, sewn into their And these are things that have been taken off prisoners. Well, he doesn't know at first. What's really, uh, to me, was so important was he, nobody knew what Auschwitz was then. The word didn't mean anything. We all now know that, of course, if you arrived at Auschwitz, you should be terrified. He didn't know, and he realizes it takes him time. He's later on in his life embarrassed that he was, didn't realize straight away. But he begins to realize, hold on, there are more clothes and goods here than there are people in this prison camp. I'm seeing fellow prisoners other men my age, young, fit men, but I'm not seeing children and I'm not seeing the elderly and yet here's all their stuff. And only then does the penny drop that people are coming to this place who do not become prisoners and what happens to them, he has, as he puts it, vague suspicions and then weeks into arriving, he realizes people are being brought here for a unique purpose, unique in human history, that this is a purpose, well, not purpose built, but a, an adapted center for the killing of human beings. He does not realize that on day one. In other words, Auschwitz was not obvious even to people who were in Auschwitz, which is his moment of revelation, that he realizes there's all these pots and pans because people thought they were being resettled to new lives in the East. He gets transferred from there to this ramp, the uh, Alter Judenrampe, the old Jew ramp, the Nazis called it, it's a railway platform where for 10 months straight, his job with others is to unload the transports, these goods trains that come in with thousands of Jews and to take them off and their goods, their, jo their possessions. So, you know, in tiny parenthesis, but one of Verber's great realizations is this is business for the Nazis. This is an economic profit center for the SS. They are taking every last 
item of wealth they extract that they can extract from the Jews, and I say extract meaning literally the gold from their teeth, the hair on their heads and on their bodies, which is all used for profit. He sees these people arrive um, for 10 months straight on that ramp, and a, a, a moment of clarity reaches him, perhaps because he was a teenager and has the kind of insight that the young have, but this moment of realization where he understands that the key ingredient or key component of this Nazi killing machine is deception. That these Jews are getting off these trains and lining up in relatively orderly, quiet uh, fashion, obedient fashion, because they all believe they're about to begin a new life resettled in the East. They are obviously traumatized by their journey, but they think maybe the trauma is now at an end and we're going to live together with our families and our children in a new village in Poland. And that, they believe that because they have been lied to at every step of the way, in often elaborate ways. And that's when he thinks the only way to stop this Nazi killing machine is to end this deception. And so he thinks somebody has to get out of here and tell Jews of Europe what awaits them at the end of this railway line because they can see they do not know. Every person he sees gets off that train has no idea what awaits them. And he, again, with the, uh, tr you know, the marvellous arrogance of youth, thinks somebody's got to escape. It might as well be me. And that's where the line comes in in your book where he's, he, he thinks it's much easier to slaughter lambs than to hunt deer. Yeah, it's a, it's a brutal way of putting it. And he says it to Claude Landsman, and I think Landsman is shocked. I'm not sure Landsman uses it in the film. Um, he says, you know, having spent his teenage years in the Slovak countryside, he has seen, uh, he has experienced that it is much easier for a, uh, you know, a slaughterer to slaughter a, a column of sheep who go in in orderly fashion than it is to be a mark, you know, a, sh a, sh a hunter picking off deer. And what he meant by that was if, if there was panic, he thought if the Jews had information that they knew they were about to be killed, he didn't have illusions that they would suddenly mount an armed revolt. You know, these were people in their 70s and 80s, they were children, none of them had weapons. But he thought they might panic. And if they panicked, if there was a stampede on that railway platform and they suddenly scattered, how much harder for the SS to have to shoot this one and shoot that one than it would be for this, this systematized method they have now where they are able to kill hundreds and hundreds and hundreds uh, every hour uh, through their, this fine-tuned industrial, I mean, it is, it is Henry Ford's assembly line method applied to murder. Uh, that, 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 that's what he aims for. He says, let the Jews be dear who are scattered as they get shot, because some will get away, rather than be sheep. And for that to be possible, he believes, they have to have the information. He becomes obsessed with the notion of information that once people know, that will be the way to grind this killing machine to a halt, Or at least to throw sand in the gears. He doesn't, he's not, he doesn't have... Uh, exaggerated uh, view of what this might achieve, but that it will achieve that. And the idea of compliance was one of the things that, that really animated him and made him furious, particularly later on. We'll get to that, but before we do, mm. let's talk about the escape itself and what came after. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not going to tell you exactly how they escaped, <laughs> because I want you all to read the book. Um, and it is extraordinary in my, in my book. I mean, it's, 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 it's dramatic uh, in, the, you know, in the purest sense. But what it, I will tell you this, what it turns on is he and Wetzler together spot a gap in the Nazi defences. And I don't mean a literal gap, you know, a hole in a fence. It's rather a kind of loophole. And it's brilliant. He sees a flaw in their method. He would later become a scientist. And there is something in the sort of the cool scientific brain that sees a logical flaw in the Nazi method. Again, nobody else had seen it before. Um, but the, he sees that flaw. It involves um, you know, an act of tremendous bravery and, and psychological sort of resilience, what they have to do in order to get out. Again, I'm not going to give it away. But once they have actually got out of the perimeter of the camp you know, uh, uh, and on their way, they had been warned, they had been advised, that's actually when the hard stuff begins, because you will then be in Nazi-occupied Poland. 
you know, it's not as if you're suddenly, you've made it into freedom. You're outside the perimeter of Auschwitz. You're in Nazi-occupied Poland, and Rudy put it brilliantly in a letter where he said, you know, we, we had no map, no compass, no friends. And what he meant by that was, unlike Polish prisoners who were hooked up and connected with the Polish resistance, there was no network of contacts on the outside for a Jew from Auschwitz. They got out these two boys, one a teenager, and they're on their own in uh, the middle of occupied Poland. Where fact, the, are, the, the, sorry, the only map that he had was a memory of a map that he'd seen, the yes, Charles Atlas, which yes. he'd seen in, in Canada. In Canada, one of the most poignant facts is that in Canada there were children's, Canada with K, there were children's exercise books and children's atlases because parents brought things for their children to learn. And so his job in Canada was sorting and sorting and sorting, and he finds a child's atlas. And in a moment of tremendous bravery, he tears off a page of the atlas and memorizes it and works out exactly where he is. And that is all he has, that memory, to navigate his way, to realize how he gets from Auschwitz to navigate his way to Slovakia, which is where he and Fred were from and where they were determined to get to a hundred or so kilometers, um, they have to get there across marshland, across forest, through, across rivers, across mountains. They have been advised that they can, the only way to do it is at night, uh, because if anybody sees you during the day, there could be either ethnic Germans, the SS have settled the area with ethnic Germans, or Nazi collaborators, Polish collaborators with the Nazis. You cannot trust anybody. Um, and so they have to, and they sometimes get lost, they run into danger, they do in the end have to speak to people, they take huge risks, at one point they come under uh, German gunfire, but somehow they make it to the border with Slovakia. Uh, it takes them 11 days. They have, you know, they are foraging, eating just whatever they can get in the forests. They are bad, they are in a state of tremendously ill health. Somehow they make their way to the remnant Jewish community of Slovakia. Slovakia Jewish community was tiny anyway, but there was a handful who were left who had not been deported like he had been to, their, uh, to, to concentration camps and to their deaths. And there in a basement in hiding in a provincial town of Zilin, and I'd been in that basement, I went there uh, last year, um, they then poured out this, their story and it was taken down by these you know, <coughs> underground Jewish leaders who uh, realize, and they really put them through their paces, they don't, they are skeptical at first. Uh, they, they are determined, you know, how do you know? Um, maybe now's the time to talk about his memory. Yes. Um, I mean, they didn't have any documents with them. They were reliant on Rudolf Werber in particular. Wetzler had a good memory too, but Werber had a freakishly good memory. When he uh, had been on that railway platform, determined to get the word out. He had known, and I think this is another huge insight, he had realized that no one was going to believe a teenager, that they would think it was a tall story. He anticipated that reaction. And therefore he thought, I have to gather the most meticulous record of facts to prove, because this is outlandish, to say, that, to claim that in the middle of Europe there is a factory that exists to produce human corpses. I mean, it's unimaginable. Nothing like it had ever existed before. Um, so he decided there that he had to be meticulous in his accumulation of facts. And so he memorized every transport that arrived. And sometimes there were five in a single night. What do I mean by memorize? He would remember the point of origin. He would remember the number of wagons, of cattle cars. He would then work out, the because he was unloading the people, how many were in each cattle car on average and make an estimate and then memorize that chain of facts. And then he would memorize the next one and the one after that. And he did it. He later told, again in a letter, how he did it. He, the, he did the equivalent of a child's memory game. You know, when I went to market, I had a basket, a tomato, and a lettuce. And then the next day, I had a basket, a lettuce, a tomato, and a stick. And then he would, and that's how he did it. He would, each day he would say the transports he knew of, and then add the new one. And he did it over and over and over again in his head. And so when he sat in that basement, he was able to spell out, pour out the detail, every last detail, 
of these transports. And the people receiving the information were the Jews of Slovakia who were able to say to him, who were able to check rather, what he said because he was able to say there was a transport on, I'm making this up, but the 20th of August from um, Sered, say, in Slovakia, and these were the number of people on, and he knew names of individuals who were on them, and he would say Esther Klein was on that transport. <coughs> they, the remnant Jewish community, had kept records of when people had gone, and they were able to check and say, he's right, Esther Klein did leave on the 20th of etc. And so they checked out his account, and it did check out, and the man who took it down the evidence later gave a deposition, um, uh, a legal deposition saying that the, this young man had the most extraordinary memory, a wonderful memory was his word, uh, that they were able to set it all down. And it became a 32-page, single-spaced report, the Verba Wetzler report, named after these two people, which then would go on its own journey. Well, let's talk about that journey and the impact that, uh, that their heroism, because there were two of them, mustn't forget, that, uh, that uh, both of them uh, had on the course of the war to some extent, yeah. uh, deportations, um, and the saving of lives. So at that, at that time, it was 1944, so people did know or beginning, were beginning to know, the world was beginning to know about Auschwitz, about what was happening. The Allies had not bombed the train tracks, had not taken action to stop the uh, deportation of, uh, of Jews to Auschwitz. Um, so there was some knowledge around, but he accelerated that process and actually saved lives in the process. Yes, I mean, I'll just push back on one point there, that they didn't yet know, the world didn't know about Auschwitz at all until this report came out. And the argument about whether to bomb the railway tracks or not is triggered by this report. Right. Mm -hmm. So the report comes out, it then embarks on its own extraordinary journey. I don't think until this book it's ever been put together how the word got out. But it, it sort of has an escape of its own. It's passed hand to hand across borders, people in the resistance, a whole unlikely cast of characters, you know, uh, unofficial diplomats, re rebel priests, resistance figures, a woman who translates it into uh, Hungarian in an attic room in secret. Um, one, by one, one way out or another, it does incredibly find its way out of um, Slovakia and to the desks of Winston Churchill himself, who literally writes a note in the margin of it, a copy to, the, uh, off, uh, to Franklin Roosevelt in Washington and to the Pope in Rome. As far as redevelopment was concerned, as soon as that happened, obviously Auschwitz would uh, grind to a halt. I mean, he, he believed the proof that the world did not know about Auschwitz and the reason why he was so determined to escape was the fact that Auschwitz was functioning. To him, it was obvious that if the world knew, of course they wouldn't let this happen. Um, the word gets to uh, Washington and to London it encounters scepticism again, uh, partly born of prejudice. So there are documents, which I quote here, Foreign Office documents saying, even allowing for a degree of Jewish exaggeration, uh, the details in here are pretty here, harrowing. And then someone else in the Foreign Office says, it's my view that the office, the Foreign Office, has spent far too much time on these wailing Jews anyway. So there's prejudice slows it down. And then there's practicalities. And I go through how, uh, you know, uh, Churchill gives an uh, instruction to Anthony Eden, get anything out of the Air Force you can, because by then a note has been attached to the Verba Wetzler report by Jewish leaders saying, please bomb the railway tracks. And he, uh, Churchill takes it seriously. The RAF say, well, that's impossible. This is something that would have to be done by day. Head of the Air Ministry, we're doing by night. Talk to the Americans. You know, it goes, and it's going through this bureaucracy um, where each person is sending a note, and this seems more your department than my department. While meanwhile, at that point, 12 to 15,000 Jews are being murdered every single day. And the frustration uh, 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 of that, I hope, is, is sort of conveyed. Um, it does even go to the Jewish leadership in Hungary. And this was the community, the group that Verber most wanted to reach because he knew that the Jews of Hungary were next. It was the last community of Europe that, that had not yet been touched hadn't been pulled into the Nazi inferno. And he wanted desperately to get word to them. The Jewish leadership in Hungary, this is an area of huge argument and, 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 and sort of bitter controversy. Uh, Rudolf Kastner, the de facto leader of Hungarian Jews, gets a copy of the report more or less the day it's finished. The man who took down the dictation, who said Verba had a wonderful memory, takes it by hand 
hands it to Kastner, essentially saying this is what's going to happen to the 700, 800,000 remaining you know, the Jews of Hungary. And Kastner does not pass on the warning to the Jews of Hungary. That report stays locked in a drawer in Budapest. Um, it is the source of the deep anger that I was referring to before that Verber felt. Uh, the, uh, he retitled his memoir, I Cannot Forgive. And Goethe, over the first childhood sweetheart who I sat, sat talking to in that garden in London, in Muswell Hill, said to me, you know, everyone thinks his book is called I Cannot Forgive because of Hitler and the Nazis, and that's true, but also included in that is Rudolf Kastner. Rudy could not forgive him, Reju Kastner, for, passing on his, for failing to pass on his warning. But all of that said, <coughs> Somehow, the report does, among all the other people it reaches and hits these brick walls, you know, nothing coming out of Washington, nothing coming out of London, nothing coming out of Rome. My view, again, professionally biased, is finally, thank God, it reaches a journalist. Uh, and it reaches a British journalist. It reaches Walter Garrett, British journalist for the Exchange Telegraph news agency sitting in Zurich, uh, which is done where there's not a neutral country, not some military censorship. And Garrett realizes this is the scoop of the century, and he himself sends, files the story. And at last, it gets out to Swiss newspapers and then eventually the British newspapers. And, and that is the first time the word Auschwitz is known in world opinion. Yes, at the very t highest leadership level, there were inklings, but nothing like the detail they get. And once it's public, then, in a way, Roosevelt is shamed and the Pope is shamed to, make, to act on what they actually already knew, but as if they've only just found out. And the Pope writes a plea to the uh, regent of Hungary, uh, Miklos Horty, and says, I plead with you uh, to save the lives of these unfortunate souls. He can't bring himself to say the word Jews. And uh, Roosevelt, through a, 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 an intermediary, sends a message to Horty saying, if you are on the losing side of the war, anybody who is held to have facilitated the deportation of Hungary's Jews will be held account for what he doesn't yet call war crimes. And Horty then, panicked by this cable from Washington, halts the deportations. And at that point, the 200,000 Jews of Budapest have not yet been deported. And so therefore, the Verbovetzer report, through that series of diplomatic moves, leads to the saving of 200,000 Jewish lives, which is why I think that Werber and Wetzler are towering figures of this period. Fascinating. Well, just, just before, one more question before we open it up to the, to the floor. We've got two minutes until that will happen. Um, just talk about his, uh, his, him as a person after the war for the rest of his life. And you've talked about his rage, his bitterness. Yeah. Um, and you speculated about that how that may account for the fact that he hasn't become very well known until, until now. Um, Elie Wiesel had a similar attitude towards what he called Holocaust kitsch, the sort of um, the industry, the Holocaust industry, the Auschwitz industry in the public mind, the popular industry. Yeah. Um, and Elie Wiesel uh, famously described it as a little history, a heavy dose of sentimentality and suspense, a dash of theological ruminations about the silence of God, and there it is, let kitsch rule in the land of kitsch. Now, this is not a kitsch man. No, and I think Verber may well have thought that was a pretty you know, good description in, in his times of, of Elie Wiesel himself, who right. was not averse to offering that little mixture. I mean, Wiesel, look, a, Wiesel himself, a huge figure, obviously, and a very, very important witness. But, but Wiesel was in a way who I have in mind when, when uh, Verber wrote that note about I couldn't be that kind of Holocaust survivor. Because Verber, you know, he wouldn't adopt that kind of uh, sonorous, mournful voice and these universal reflections. He would start dishing it out and start blaming the people who he thought needed to hear it. So when Verber spoke in Germany, and he was invited to speak in Germany, he would attack Germans and Nazis and Hitler, absolutely. But when he was speaking to Western audiences, he would say, don't sit there feeling comfortable that you were the good guys. You know, that Roosevelt and Churchill, the great liberators, they didn't do enough. 
And to Jewish audiences, he would start pointing the finger at Jewish leaders like Kastner, who had failed. He would not serve up this morally uh, uncomplicated story, which was Hitler and the Nazis were evil and everyone else was the good guys. That was not the story he was there to tell. And it meant that, I mean, to me, this was ama astonishing. I spoke to, Ver Verber in his later life ended up as a professor, an associate professor. He was never promoted to the full rank of professor of biochemistry at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And I spoke there with people who knew him and colleagues, including a, a sort of Jewish community leader, who told me something which is, a, to me, amazing. Um, you know, Vancouver doesn't have the largest Jewish population in the world. Vancouver would organize an annual gathering, a sort of memorial event, educational event, um, about the Holocaust for high school students. And they would invite Vancou Holocaust survivors living in Vancouver um, to address this conference. They did not invite Rudolf Verber, right? He was living in Vancouver, the ultimate witness. They wouldn't invite him, why? Because they couldn't, said the man I interviewed, be sure that he would not descend into accusations and rage. Uh, he would not tell the story they wanted him to tell. They thought these 16, 17 year old high school students couldn't handle what he was going to say because he would immediately start pointing the finger. He was full of that anger. He was somebody who just would not buckle. And so, again, why it's called the escape artist, he made his life afterwards in post-war Czechoslovakia, where, you know, where he married Goethe, Goethe Verbova, uh, who I interviewed in that garden. And you know, he straight away started chafing again with this, the lack of freedom of living in a totalitarian society. And also living in a place where he couldn't tell the truth about his own experience because you know, the communist orthodoxy was that they, there wasn't a, Jew, a Holocaust of Jews, there was instead you know, fascist action against anti-fascists. Mm. And so he wanted to say, describe what he'd actually seen and he couldn't. And so he escaped in again another dramatic escape, a sort of Cold War style midnight escape from uh, Czechoslovakia. So he was somebody who was awkward and uncomfortable and abrasive and people didn't always want to hear that kind of testimony. And so the result is this man who had this, who had, I think it should be credited jointly with the saving of 200,000 lives, who had done this, the most uh, heroic escape, I think, of the entire Second World War, who had borne witness to Auschwitz before anyone else knew about it, had influenced the decisions of you know, the, the Allied leaders. When he died, when he, for his funeral in Canada, there was not even a quorum, a minion, in Jewish terms, there were not 10 people there to say the memorial prayers. I mean, they had a memorial service in Vancouver for him. There were 40 or so people there, fewer than are in this room. Um, he went, he died pretty well, you know, with, with some exceptions, but basically unrecognized. And so part, you know, you asked me at the beginning about the motive for writing this book. It just seemed so wrong to me that this man hadn't been recognized. And so I hope I've you know, made some a small step towards at last people knowing who he was and knowing what he did. I think so. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Um, now let's move to any questions from the audience. There's one in the corner there. Thank you. That's really fascinating. One of the conundrums in my mind as I've heard your story is this, this man with rage and anger. Was he, was he like that as a 17, 18, 19-year-old? Did this only come afterwards? Because I can't really imagine how he survived two years without displaying that rage and anger and, and not having sort of drawn attention to himself? Such an interesting question. Thank you. I mean, he, he um, I you know, haven't made enough of this. He was also, everybody says, and you can see it in the interviews and things, tremendously charming, charismatic, oddly funny man. In fact, there's this very amazing moment in the interview where Claude Landsman is unnerved by the fact that Rudy is smiling as he's describing these things and says to him, why do you smile so much? And Verba looks at him, still smiling, and says, do you prefer that I should cry? Again, the same you know, tense dynamic. But he was this charismatic man. He spoke all these languages as a teenager, which is one reason why he was, you know, helped. I say one reason why he survived. He, like all Holocaust survivors, was insistent that mainly it was luck, random good luck, that kept him alive. And if you ask Holocaust survivors why they survived, they almost always say that. They don't like the idea there was some kind of skill because it suggests the dead were somehow less skilled and that's not right. But he had great charisma. He had spoke, you know, 
Czech and Slovak and German and Russian and some English, some Hungarian, which made him very useful to the resistance in Auschwitz. Um, so he had, you know, all these, quali um, you know, uh, strengths, uh, physically very strong. But uh, I think the the anger and rage was d did come later. One thing that Goethe said to me was very interesting. She said, you know, Rudy was paranoid, and there are examples in the story about his paranoia later. But she says everyone thinks it was Auschwitz that made him paranoid. She says they're wrong. He was. It was his paranoia that helped him survive Auschwitz. He was so, uh, un, um, whatever the opposite of naive is, he was not easily trusting. And that was really helpful there. That you, skeptical. You, you know, he was skeptical. He, was, <laughs> he did not trust easily. He was always on his guard. And that was partly because of what had happened to him before Auschwitz, which is these couple of escapes that had not worked. And they had not worked in part because he had been too trusting. So he learned not to trust. And so rather than it being you know, a simple story of the damage that the Holocaust had done to him, you know, it's more complex than that. That said, he was very damaged by it. And that's, again, a word that Goethe used to me afterwards. Thank you. Um, yes, one right at the front here and then right at the back there, that's all right. Oh, thank you. Here's the mic. I'm sorry. Um, you used the phrase, the penny dropped. Was there a moment when he learned about the gas chambers in mm. particular? So, yes, that's a good, good question because there, is, there are two different stages. There's the first, the penny drops that people are dying here. And then, and it takes time for the secret of the gas chambers to come out even inside the camp. I mean, the Nazis were so meticulous about hiding that even inside the camp, they tried to keep that a secret. So the very first gas chamber in, trying to avoid being too technical, but Auschwitz I, the main camp, <coughs> Auschwitz II, is, or Birkenau, is a second sort of added on, even though it's much bigger. But people refer to the main camp. Uh, Rudy very unnervingly would sometimes refer to it as the mother camp, which is strange as a phrase. But he, in, that, in, the, in the, the first gas chamber they used, which was a sort of improvised thing, they had it outside the perimeter and it was hidden by under, you know, trees and vegetation. They would have, the Nazis would get um, a, a, a driver to turn on the engine and drive a truck around and motorbikes do the same to create a noise that would cover the sound of screams for those two minutes. Uh, it, was, it took about two minutes for the people inside to be killed. They did not even want other prisoners in the camp to know. So it did take a while, and the way, the, way, the way word reached him was partly through the sort of rumor mill of the camp um, that, uh, you know, that got to him. And people who did, it came from the Jewish prisoners who had to work in the camp who would tell people who would then tell someone else. But it took a long time, and afterwards they would all say, what did we think that, you know, when, it would, when there was, at a later stage, when the process was more industrialized and the crematoria were set up, crematoria two, three, four, and five, and there were chimneys blasting human ash into the sky, even at that stage there were people who would find it in, in themselves to know and not know. And this is one of the big themes of the book, is that the... What Rudy did discover was that there are, yes, there's deception, but there's also this tremendous human resistance to digesting unpalatable truths and to learning and to accepting and believing information even when you've got it. So there are some stories in the book that I think are, to me, amazing about how where even people who read the Verba Vetzler report could not believe it and refused to believe it. Um, it was too terrible to digest what was in there. And so there is, you know, as a story I tell in the book about an escapee, a later escapee, uh, escapee after Verba, who incredibly got recaptured and was back on a train to Auschwitz in a cattle truck and warned his fellow deportees, where we are going is a place where we will be killed the minute we arrive. Not only did they not believe him, they called out to the German guards to take away this man who was telling us these lies, and they beat him hard because he was telling something they could not bear to hear. And all of those prisoners, of course, 
were taken to Auschwitz and were taken to their deaths. Uh, that, you know, human beings, and I think of this now in a modern context, you know, we are getting warnings all the time of catastrophes. And, uh, you know, it's not the same, I'm not making that comparison, but if you think about how resistant we are to hearing, you know, terrible news about, for example, the climate emergency, there is a human impulse, it's a survival co impulse, which is to try and look away. You know, there was that film earlier this year, Don't Look Up. You know, even if a comet is hurting towards you, don't look up. When I saw that film, I immediately thought of Rudy and this story. You know, there's a quote I, I have in the book from Raymond Aron, French uh, philosopher, who says that when he heard of the Holocaust, I knew it, but I didn't believe it. And because I didn't believe it, I didn't know. Mm. And that gap between information and real knowledge was in a way the thing that the hard, hard lesson that Rudolf Verber learnt was getting out the facts actually in the end was not enough. Mm. People have to believe them and then once they believe them they have to act on them. And that was a really harsh lesson but I think it is one of real relevance to, in the age of disinformation we're in now, in the age of lies that we're in now. But the, the very first line of defence is the truth and that's what he took the ultimate risk to reveal. Sorry, I think we have time for just one more question over there. Um, sorry, you can chat to Jonathan afterwards. Yeah, thank you. There was someone over there, wasn't there, who I pointed out earlier. No, wasn't there? Okay, this, this person. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, I've read the book, and thank you for writing it. Uh, at times, it was almost too harrowing to read. Was it ever too harrowing to write? We talked about this just a moment ago, didn't we? I mean, so I, I would say a couple of things about it. I think the one thing which I didn't know until having done it, but I now think is, might be true, which is I think it's harder to read about this than it is to write about it. And the reason I say that is that I think that there's something about metabolizing this terrible material and processing it which enabled me to sort of cope with it, that it wasn't just going in, it was then coming out. And I think it's harder, for, in a way, for a reader who just has to take it in and not put it anywhere. And the strangest thing is, I went through that process myself, and then afterwards, only afterwards, I now realise that I understand on a deeper level something that Verbe himself described, which is that Rudy went on the ramp, in particular, witnessing those selections every night, um, was... Fred Wetzler and others would later say that they thought he was either on the brink of or did have a nervous breakdown, that he couldn't cope with what he was seeing. And then that moment of insight about deception came to him, and then he had a plan, which was, I'm going to uh, escape and tell the world, in, and for, in order to do that, I have to absorb and memorise everything I'm seeing. And at that point, he psychologically could cope, because he then had a purpose. He wasn't just witnessing horror every day for, for, for no reason. He felt he had a reason. And so in a strange way, I sort of, I now have a small inkling of what he was talking about there, which is if you just are reading this horrific material for no re reason, it's very, very difficult. But I had a real purpose, which is I wanted to tell this story. Um, and so I think that made it um, a bit easier. Uh, it's not related, but since we've got, if we've got in this last minute... We've got a minute 19, 18. Minute 19, so I'm going to just tell you one last story just because it was something that came to my mind, this thing about the memory, um, which I just liked to, I like people knowing about this story, which is, so people did doubt, a lot of the, in the, in the documents and things, some people doubted how could it really be possible that he memorised all this stuff? You know, he ne and he never wrote anything down. He was always insistent. Some people said maybe there were, he had documents and he had them for the escape and then dropped them, and that's why the people who received them in Slovakia never saw any documents. It's impossible that he remembered all this thing. So I found something which made me absolutely convinced he was right, and then since then there's been further proof, which we don't have time for me to tell you, but here's the story. Um, I told you that he, he, he memorised every transport, and every transport was memorizable because of the numbers that were then assigned to the people on that train load who were not sent to their deaths but became prisoners because those people were given a number 
And you know famously the number would be tattooed on the arm of every prisoner, and they also wore it on their uniform. And it meant that if you were like Verba with this incredible head for numbers, you could walk around the camp and you would see someone's number and you would know if it was a low number, that meant it was an early transport from 1942, and if it was a higher number, 1944, and if you really knew the numbers, you would know where that person had come from. In the 1970s, 30 odd years after he had escaped, Rudy was in New York, in Manhattan, in a restaurant in the summer, and it was a hot day, and his waiter came to the table with his shirt sleeves rolled up, and Rudy saw the number on the waiter's arm. And he said to him, Benjen, 18th of May, 1943. And the waiter paled and said, how did you know? And he knew because he had seen the number on his arm. And he'd worked out from that number, 30 years on, the day of the transport, the point of origin, the transport he'd been on. That was the kind of memory he had. I toyed with calling this book The Memory Man, uh, because that was also uh, how he was able to, to do it. But um, he had a tremendous gift, and he put it to um, the ultimate use. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much, Jonathan Friedland.